Hello, my name is Gary Wimmer. I'm the person who started the Network Austin Mixer many years ago. I think you're seeing Tootie Hall on the screen. She's one of our core members. I'm going to let Tootie introduce herself, tell you a little about herself, and proceed with the meeting from there. Tootie, always great to have you, my dear. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tootie Hall. I'm an actor with acclaimed talent. And as Gary said, I'm one of the new core members. I'm also a veteran and I have the Veterans Teddy Bear Project. And if anyone is interested, we're also collecting stuffed animals for the veterans in hospice, CLC and nursing home in Temple and in Houston, Texas. And um, I think Judith is on here. If Judith is on here. Could you introduce yourself? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Judith Reuter been helping the Austin, the Network Austin Mixer for over a decade. And I'm very glad to see that all of you are here. Let's make our industry great in Central Texas. Thank you, Judith. And we'll be followed by Denise, who is our host for the evening. Hello, everybody. Um, hope y'all can see me. Now I know what Gary was talking about, about not being able to see himself in speaker view while he's recording. <laughs> Um, I'm Denise Garza, and I am an actor, singer, director, producer in Austin. Uh, I'm with Acclaimed Talent as well, um, and I am going to uh, be interviewing our guests this evening, guests this evening, um, along with giving you all the opportunity to ask questions. Um, Tootie will be watching the chat if you have any questions for our guests. Um, so I would like to welcome Vicki Boone and Michael Druck um, as our wonderful casting director guests this evening. And I will let them introduce themselves uh, before we get started. So um, Vicki, Michael, sure. whichever one of you wants to go first. Okay, I'll go. Um, hi, it's so great to see everybody. Uh, and uh, thank you for having me tonight. And I, my name is Vicki Boone. I'm a casting director here in Austin and um, I wish that I had met all of you in person before, <laughs> you know, it's the one of the big uh, things we lament is that we don't actually get to um, have the same kind of personal relationships that we used to have about three years ago um, with actors, you know, which was just such a special thing. Our, our uh, jobs have changed so much. So it's really nice to meet you in this context. And if I haven't met you before, I hope I get to meet you in person at some point, but our company, we do, um, uh, a lot of narratives. We do TV and film and commercials. And we have a pretty big office. We've got um, uh, Liz Kelly, Chantel Williams Jackson, and Hannah Smith are full time associates in our office. So you probably will interact with them a lot if you interact with our office. And Edna Diaz, and um, uh, mainly Edna, I guess at this point, is the other uh, sort of part time, sometimes person. So that's the, our office. And we're in the Red Building at uh, Austin Studios. Thank you, Vicki. Mm -hmm. Michael? Hello, Michael Dreck here. A lot of familiar faces here. And uh, like we were just saying too, um, it's a nice quick chance for me and Vicki to do a quick catch up because sometimes we don't always get to talk to each other <laughs> right. except for a quick email. Um, yeah, I, I'm kind of like a jack of all trades. Um, I do a lot of indie casting. I do a lot of quick commercials. Uh, Y'all probably seen a lot of my extras casting calls. I started in extras casting and I kind of evolved from there. And um, and I also cast not just in Texas, but sometimes I'll do some jobs in LA or other remote areas too. So happy to have that on my resume. And um, and my crew is relatively small. You know, um, I have one to two associate or assistants at a time. When it's busy, I think we manage up to like six helpers at a time. And Vicky remembers those days. You know, when you're you're doing extras on two shows and principals on one or two, and then the ongoing daily influx. It just depends. So I have a great group of people who I can call on whenever we're busy. And y'all probably interacted with a few of them before virtually, even if it just says my name on there. And yeah, great and honored to be back here again. And you know, I wish we were in person too. But uh, this is also great because anyone can just drop in and. Say hello. So yeah, that's me. Thank you all so much. Hello, and thank you. I just saw one question pop in the chat. And uh, Michael, I'm actually going to ask that question um, later on. So um, thank you. Um, first, I want to just <laughs> ask uh, the two of you in general, if 
you could explain the casting process. What is the role of a casting director? Vicki? Well, let's see, great question. Um, I think the role of a casting director is uh, to really facilitate the director's vision uh, by like trying to understand what they're trying to accomplish with each of the roles and then to be sort of a shortcut to um, matching the talent uh, in whatever community you're working in to uh, to the project as quickly you can, as you can. And so um, after you, um, you know, feel like you have a, a beat on what the director wants and um, it's to the process is to, you know, audition and narrow to the point where you can bring um, the handful of uh, people who might bring the project to life into a callback with the director and get somebody cast. That's really it. Tell the story, you know. Thank you, Vicki. Right. Michael, do you have anything to add or a different take on that? Yeah, uh, in addition to, it's great when it's just you and the director in a casting team, but you know, in commercial especially, there's a whole committee of people we got to please and think ahead for, and we're not just getting in the head of the director. There's, mm -hmm. and also we're, you know, a breakdown, you know, those casting calls are just, you know, we develop that with them. We go over sometimes budget, rate, usage. We're kind of that, I jokingly say we're the HR of the acting industry. <laughs> you know, we don't get the benefits of it, but, <laughs> but we do get to kind of, we're there on the actor's behalf too. And we're working in, um, in tangent with the agents and with the actors and any freelance actors that we might encounter, it just depends on, on the role. And then also we're factoring in the time, you know, with the technology we're expected to deliver. I mean, when we first started, right, when you say, Vicky, we had a lot longer to cast and now it's like, how soon can we get tape tomorrow? And so we're trying yeah. to facilitate those needs as soon as possible. So when we're um, vetting the best choices, the best actors, we also got to know who can deliver in that short amount of time. Too. So mm -hmm. That's what yeah. I'll add. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, what do you think are the biggest misconceptions about casting directors? Michael, do you want to take this one first? We are not the decision makers. Absolutely. <laughs> People <laughs> always think, right, that they're like, well, how can you have it cast me? I go, I'm not the one making the decision. <laughs> And I think, and as long as people learn the business of show business, that'll just be a huge attribute to just your acting career in general. You need to know the business side, but just also the, the, the breakdown, Vicky was just talking about the director. Well, you know, that's just one cog in the machine, you know, for approval. There's studios involved, there's clients, there's the one signing the check, there's average. Now that we're, tech, we're with this technology now, um, everyone has a say. And when you get into like a bigger project, there's more people chiming in with their opinions and who should get the role and who shouldn't and all that stuff. So that's the biggest mis misconception I can think of. What about you, Vicki? I would agree with you 100% that um, we're, we're really not the people. We're like the, like I said, I, I feel like a matchmaker. I'm like always trying to interpret and then trying to match you know, I could be in real estate. It's the same. I mean, it's not literally the same thing, but it's about like <laughs> connecting and finding chemistry between the director and the people. Um, but it's not, it's not really my choice. And, and I always say it's not, there's no point in, in uh, giving the director my set of crayons. You know what I mean? Like you have to find their set of crayons. You have to find the, you have to find the, um, the yeah. uh, cast that's going to inspire them, you know? So, uh, and it may not be who I would choose if I were, going to cast my own film so it's really about them or like Michael was saying uh, sometimes it's the network vision or a commercial vision or whatever but it's important that they have um, the people that that they want so it's really not me that makes the decisions except who gets the initial audition and we do own the fact that th those are our decisions who gets the auditions um, but the other thing is of course is that um, the biggest mis misconception or something that people may not know in their hearts is that we're always on your side <laughs> You know, I mean, we're always on your side every single time, every single tape, every windows back in the room. We, it's so true. We always hope that you're going to be the one, you know, because we're just dying to have, you know, to have the one walk in the room. So we're, we're always on your side, you know, and we have a lot of respect for the craft of acting. And um, I know that it's something that I could never do. You're like I would be scared, you know, out of out of my mind to do what actors do every single time they audition. So, I have an incredible amount of respect for um, the courage and the the craft, you know, of acting. So, 
And I'll just add one more thing mm -hmm. to that. Um, I was thinking about that when you were talking about that. It's great when we do have that repeat business because then they start to trust our instincts and they're like, okay, mm -hmm. go ahead and bring someone to, or I, well, we like to say wild cards. Like, I know this isn't yeah. quite what you're looking for, but trust me, I want you to know who these people are. And that's always my goal too in an audition. It's not about who's going to book the role. I want them to start to get to know the talent pool. I want them to start to trust our instincts. Like, trust the process. That's a big mm -hmm. thing. A lot of times when we're working with, indie filmmakers or a first-time client in from out of town we're breaking them in we're te we're showing them how we do our job so mm -hmm. we're managing those expectations too and um yeah um and going back to what Vicky was saying too, you know, about us being your biggest, we want you to just watch, and we don't know what they're looking for too. So again, you know, it, it could be sometimes I'm like, oh, that person booked it. That's interesting. But then it, it opens up our mind to be like, wow, some people are making some choices that these directors are liking. And, and we can go more and more into that. That could be a whole class on self tapes and stuff like that and the choices that people are making now. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, we're not in the room organically, so we can't feel that intrinsic energy so we just have to trust that you're going to bring it to the party and then mm -hmm. whoever we show the director you know that they'll like who we're ultimately bringing to them yep thank you both those are really great um we do have some more questions coming in the chat i'll get to them in a little bit because um i have a topic on some of those as well um how do you see the industry in texas in the next five years vicky you want to take that one as big as Atlanta, totally joking. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we had 80 TV shows shooting like Atlanta. Like that's, if we all just think positively and we all just lobby like crazy and then we all vote for the right people, you know, maybe we can have that. But uh, uh, where we are right now, I, you know, I, I, um, I don't know. It's a little bit nerve wracking uh, what the, the, Texas specific market is going to be like mm -hmm. this last would, year was not good for that you know yeah right yeah. And, you, and Vicky you encounter a lot of people from LA or New York who've relocated to Texas right away I feel like we have to break it down and be like it's a commercial town you got to get used to those commercials and you mm -hmm. know, for every five commercials you might get one or two episodic or you know if you're lucky and then you might get some film but that's just the environment they're going to have to get used to people love shooting commercials here thank god like I can pay my rent you know because of that <laughs> but at the same time there can always be more and, and, you know, that's a great way, you know, that's part of our business structure too. Mm -hmm. And um, there's so many, so many great filmmakers here. And I just wish there was more work for them, not just UT, but so many other great film markets. And they want to keep living in Texas and working with our local crew and working with our locations here. And it's just a beautiful place to shoot. So um, I, and I know LA, they fall in love with Austin all the time you know by how many people are moving there <laughs> in Dallas and all those areas um but yeah going back to the, the main point of the five years I do think the commercial field will continue to grow and mm -hmm. yeah we just gotta just you gotta educate yourself on how these um the, these uh film incentives do get passed and what role they play even going down to your local reps and be like are you supporting our film industry and then so more work yeah. goes from here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important too. Um, and I know somebody popped in the chat to be sure to follow TXMPA um, because they do help with, is it the lobbying? Vicki, I wanna make sure that um, to get, they meet with the reps and, and such. I do believe, I mean, yes, absolutely. Yeah, uh, TXMPA does a masterful job of- Yes. Of sort of they hire a lobbyist on the our lobby behalf. every year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know that they're trying to ask um, for a big number this year, um, but I, you know, I saw, I was mentioning to Vicki earlier, I saw the preliminary bill that was filed and, they, and nothing was slashed. So, you know, hopeful that, that things at least stay the way they've been, but, you know, always, always hope for more because that will just be more opportunities for all of us here. Um, so yes, get involved um, uh, in TXMPA. Um, all right, Vicki and Michael, what has been your favorite project to cast and why? Vicki? Um, you know, I was thinking about that. Uh, I've actually had a, a, a number of really truly favorite projects just in the last year. I mean, I, I'm just going to say super quickly that uh, 
Hitman that we just did, even though it went to New Orleans, it was it was written for Houston, ended up shooting in New Orleans. Absolutely one of my favorites. It's a a, a dark, um, you know, a Norish comedy, uh, and uh, it's going to be great. But um, the show that Michael and I both worked on last year, Mo, uh, with Mo Ammer, um, that was just a blast. I had had it? So, it was great. so much fun <laughs> working on that. Mo and Slick were just the best, and. Uh, I'm a real, like, I'm from Houston originally, and I was so excited to see a show come in where the creators really wanted to, like, bring um, Houston, the way Houston, you know, the just bring Houston to life as it is in, uh, like, a, a, you know, a story. Um, and I thought that Moments Slick did a great job. It was so fun to cast that. I just had a blast doing that. So I would definitely say that was probably one of my my favorite projects. Um, probably my favorite projects ever and we're also working on a super cool project right now which is a, a called kill your idols and um it's a kind of a um uh like a, a super bad but about um uh punk rock boys from the rio grande valley uh trying to make it to their first gig and uh it's dropped so we did a big scout recently in the rgv looking for real uh little punk rock kids and it was just so much fun um so that movie won't get made until this fall but already i'm counting it as one of my favorites um you know because i hadn't been to a punk rock show in many years <laughs> so it was super fun yeah great thank you uh michael what about you oh uh, well it sounded I, like you like I, mo Oh, I saw that breakdown about the Rio Grande punk kids and that's great i was like and i do so a lot fun. of commercials down there and it's the whole mm -hmm. like there's just great people down there. Mm -hmm. I love that. So, and I'm glad when we're just not just shooting in one area. And yeah, Mo was fun. And I will use that as a quick little tangent. Um, there are times where casting gets to collaborate with each other. It's very rare, but mm -hmm. I love it, you know, because, you know, first of all, Vicky's just a great person and a great team player. So I will sing her praises there. And I think we all know why she's great. And <laughs> she's, she's horrible at giving herself credit. But, you know, there's times where I've worked on jobs where the other casting team aren't being so helpful. I'll be like, hey, who cast the lead so I can match this person? And they'll be like, that's not my job. But Vicky will be like, let's talk about it. I want you to get in the director's head. So so we get the best. But anyways, I remember when we cast The Bride, that was more of a collaborative effort. That was so fun. And yeah. you killed I remember, it. She was and, so and, great. And, 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 and I'm very like, I see things as they're coming alive. I'm like, wait, uh -huh. I saw you did a breakdown. Are they not looking my options? And then she's like, and then this is a, a an opportunity where Vicky totally just came to my rescue or distrusted my instinct. She goes, well, how many options do you have? I said, like 30. You're like, oh, I got three. Let's use yours. Yeah. <laughs> And then, and then you, you backed me up to the producers. Mm -hmm. You said, choose one of Michael's girls. And I thought that totally. was great. And, and, and I think, mm -hmm. and also we're, we're also trying to fight, you know, to not fight or just, you know, push like, is this a lead or is this a speaking role? Is it not? So those are the communications that the casting does. Anyways, so Mo was fun. Apollo 10 and a half. I just thought the whole thing from beginning to end, that was another collaboration with Vicky. Right. And she set mm -hmm. me up for success. And then what I love about Richard Linklater, and if you've ever got the chance, there are no extras, meaning he handpicks every single person. You're part of his universe yeah. and, and, and his team's universe. And you saw how everyone was superimposed and animated. It was just, just to see that payoff. You know, it was just beautiful. And if you were lucky enough to be on that show, you understand. And it was a controlled environment. And it, we wrapped right before COVID shut everything down. And last but not least, um, there was a beautiful indie I did called In Search of Lost Continents. Great local filmmakers I worked with. Uh, nice BIPOC casting. And that was really one of the first opportunities I, ha I saw in the room live where the director and the writer just rewrote a role because the actor blew him away. So like they were going to cast a, a boy and a girl and they decided to cast two sisters instead because they couldn't decide on how great, mm -hmm. you know, which girl to go with. And so anyways, I just wanted to share that. Thank y'all so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I just wanted to um, also mention those of you who are um, putting questions in the chat, we're trying to keep up with them. We will get an opportunity to open the floor for you to ask the questions. Um, but I did see some coming to me directly. Um, and if you could put them for everyone uh, or send them to Tootie because she's writing them down. If we don't um, get to your questions, maybe it's something that we can um, ask offline and send them out. Um, but we'll talk, we'll, we'll see what we can get to. We, we're, we're running well on time. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges with the way casting is done today? And what are the advantages? Okay. 
I want to, well, I mean, I know we all, we all want to talk about self tapes and stuff like that, but I want to talk about another challenge. I'll let Michael talk about self tapes, but I think that um, cross boarding is a really a big challenge for casting. And it was something that um, we encountered on both of the shows we did last year on Love and Death and on um, um, Mo. Love and Death was cross boarding like 240 pages, um, <laughs> just, just, a whole lot of content. Mo was cross in that for that was four episodes. Mo was cross boarding um, the same amount of pages and it, but it was eight 30 minute episodes that they were rewriting at the same time. What the challenge comes in for actors and for the casting process is that um, traditionally on like a, a series, like you might audition for the pilot and then you might audition Oh, they bring you back and audition you for a role in episode three and you know they're kind of spaced out but when they cross board it and we have to cast 80 roles in like two and in like love and death we had to cast 80 roles in four weeks and so i know some of you and i know some people i can see in here who read for several roles on mo also the reads were they're so uh, compressed like you would like get an audition request on Tuesday and then have to have it in on Thursday but then you get another one on Friday but it's for a different role I mean it seems like we're psycho like <laughs> we don't know what to do with you but the it's it I want to blame it very strongly on crossboarding and how many pages we are having to cast um up front before they start shooting and we're casting are not union members so we don't really have a union uh, representative to speak to about this, but people who are in um, the acting union or any other union that is affected by that, which I can't, I mean, I'm sure wardrobe is affected by that, you know, um, I think that there should be some sort of cap on the number of pages that can be cross-boarded because I think it it's, doesn't make for a very good process, not to mention how hard it is for the actor to, to perform um, scenes from eight episodes in one day, <laughs> you know, anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there that I think crossboarding is, is a really big problem. I don't mind a little crossboarding, but like maybe 180 pages most, you know, uh, but it needs to be pulled in, I think for the, for that, the audition process in particular. Thank I have you. a question for you, Vicki, coming from casting. So cross mm -hmm. I dealt with that a little bit when we worked on The Affair in LA, just like five episodes. So you're like, oh, that's that's not as bad as what you had to deal with. But um, is it usually because uh, you have to shoot out a location or an actor's availability or both? Typically? No, it's because they want to cast, um, they want to cast the whole block before they start. Um, okay. So the, the block okay. is 240. So for like Love and Death, the 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 block was five months, 240 pages. Um, the shoot started in late September, and the block ended around February 10th. And so we had to cast every role that was going to play in for the next five months in four weeks. So it just creates a very intense process for casting, of course, but really for the actors, you know, I mean, some of y'all were just, y'all did seven tapes in like, you know, three weeks for this one show, you know? And um, so, but in part it's because the director's saying, I like this person, but the time is just too compressed. You wouldn't feel it if it were, uh, if the blocks weren't so big, if that makes sense. Got it. And yeah, you know, I just want to get clarification also because I've seen it have for different reasons. But mm -hmm. um, I'll say just offhand, the main challenge we deal with is lack of prep time or lack of time in general. Yep. You know, I can't tell you how many extras jobs I did where I had a week. And then they're like, okay, we're going to start with our first three big days and they ought to be COVID tested and we do 150 a day. And we're like, mm -hmm. okay, luckily I have a database to start from. I could imagine if someone was just starting the job from out of town. Mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes we shoot in very remote areas too, right, Vicky? Sometimes like Marfa or, you know, other places yeah. that we mm -hmm. have to send people there or we have to go there ourselves and do some scouting or yeah. uh, the, you know, um, you know, Middle Eastern extras, which we had a lot of, you know, or that whole, you know, and Mo was so helpful. For Mo, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But, um, and then self tapes in general, again, again, I'm going to just preface it. This could be a whole class on it, but just 
you know, making sure that we're getting y'all what you need. So it's just, you know, anyone can do it because you're, we understand you're having to do multiple jobs, just like we have more on our to-do list now because of this virtual world. So, you know, I want to make sure you're set up for success. You know what type of wall to be behind. You know where to look at the camera. You know, hey, just change it up. These are the different takes, or this is when you're supposed to do the slate. This is what I need in my slate. This is what a slate is, you know, all that stuff. So, um, and the, the more you're used to doing self tapes, that, that makes our life easier. And um, and yeah, I would just say time, time and prep are the probably the biggest challenges for us. I think that yeah, I think that the the um, the expect the the over expectations from the sort of the liberty of the digital world, you know, that sort of well, can I have it tomorrow? You know, um, they just want and, something to look at sometimes. I'm like, you're not going to look yeah, at it Thanksgiving and, week. You just want it in your inbox. <laughs> not having enough time for exactly. actors to really prepare it. And then and say, well, just it's too demanding. I think the industry is becoming uh, too demanding on a timeline, you know, like that. It needs some constraints. Uh, so it's just very difficult <laughs> for actors to do that much work in a short amount and of time. And everyone below the line from there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for acknowledging that, <laughs> you know. Yes. Um, and plus, not to mention to... that actors have to, now they have to um, style themselves and direct themselves and frame themselves and like and themselves. Like themselves. Uh -huh. And I mean, it's a beautiful, like, you know, bounty of creativity. It's like, wow, actors completely are masterful artists. I mean, you're, you know, the, the tapes have gotten so great. They're so cinematic and I'm in a good way. And, um, but that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for one person to do seven times in one day. It's a lot, you know. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, and we did have some questions that came through on crossboarding. I think you gave a really good explanation of what that was. Um, so if, if, if there's anybody who still um, isn't sure about that, we'll, we'll touch on that. Um, crossboarding is where they, um, they shoot, um, all um, they shoot at uh, two to you know three to seven episodes at the same time, and so like in a film, you would shoot out uh, a location, then you might shoot out a lead. You know, you have things that drive it. Um, for crossboarding, it's the same sense of um, priorities that drive the schedule. But instead of shooting out one episode or two episodes, now with the excessive crossboarding, you might be shooting out. Um, Sally's house for eight episodes, you know, so it's um, just sort of like a, it's just volume. Sounds like a continuity nightmare at some time. It at does, some doesn't time. it? Yeah, like that would be a really hard <laughs> job. The actor who has to remember, wait, did I just, you know, did I just I get know. a fight with my mother-in-law? Okay, no, okay, no, this is before. You just cried, yeah, exactly. You know? I yeah. think it must make wardrobe insane too. Like, oh, that's I, I mean, I would go nuts if you had to I, like, you know, I think I remember seeing something about um, a, a big crossboarding situation for um, I can't remember the name of the show. Danny DeVito was in it, and because of his availability, they had to shoot cer a certain amount of episodes with his scenes. And so, I mean, that would be a, a continuity nightmare. <laughs> I would. You're exactly right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, okay, cool. Um, I know we touched on self tapes and we were talking a little bit about um, some advice and you know you all both mentioned you, the expectations these days um, on actors and their self tapes. But what are some common mistakes you might see um, and do you have any advice, you know, we had some questions come in about the backgrounds. Um, what backgrounds you prefer, you know, blue, gray, green, white, etc. I, mean, I, I think that, you know, just whatever looks flattering, whatever you have available that's as plain as possible. Um, if you can get the gray or the blue or whatever works for you, that's great. But my main notes when I give self tapes uh, is uh, not in front of a window, especially during the daylight, not, a, not in front of a reflective surface. You know, these are things that people aren't really taking into consideration when they're taping. And when we watch them, it's just a total distraction. And so, and we want the client to not be distracted. We want them focused on your work. Um, and then I would say overall, just my two cents is like, you know, don't be afraid to get in there. Don't be afraid to be a little bit tighter with the frame so we can see your eyes. We can mm -hmm. see you emote. You might slate a little bit further away, change it up a bit, but then also just make a choice. Just make mm -hmm. a choice. And because there's a thousand, a million different ways to play a scene, 
you know, everyone I think wants to appease someone like, oh, how do you want it? How do you want it? How do you want it? It's like, do something, make a choice, be not, not even, be, don't be afraid to be bold, but just do it your way, you know, how you would do it. And I think that those tapes really stand out to me. And I think usually you get the call back or something like that. But Vicky, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, I have to say, I mean, just basics like Denise was alluding to that, you know, um, we like to see no profiles. We like to see both eyes. Uh, we like to see a nice clean background. We like to see good lighting. Um, we like to you have you be, you know, uh, a little closer than above your elbows is generally good for a self tape because people watch them on small screens and stuff like that. But I think what Michael was saying, we usually ask for uh, two takes. And um, I would say, don't be afraid to put your splashy take first. You know, a lot of people like to put the take that they think they're looking for, the right one, that kind the of stuff. Take. <laughs> and I think that's good. You know, it's good to go like, I think I know that they're going to want to like this and do it like that. But um, it's so much better when uh, you bring yourself to it and um, you you bring the the take that only you're going to bring. And I love to see those first because it, it they really like um, bring us to life when something different happens. Uh, it's just fun to see that. And um, the other thing that I would say is that's really good for um, self tapes is um, not not a bunch of staging, but just a little tiny bit. So like, you know, like going, you know, like, uh, you know, enter frame or play with the dynamic of close or away, or there's just little tiny things that are the same strategies that a filmmaker might use in a shot just to give, you know, some life or a sense of belief outside the frame. And um, those little itsy bitsy bits of, of staging can really elevate and bring a sense of reality. Michael, do you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Like, yeah. I love it when someone just walks in the frame. You know, you don't always have to do that. But to me, it's, it's, it's different than just starting the camera and then us yeah. seeing when you start acting. You know, because, mm -hmm. you know, not just us, but the client too. We kind of, yeah. like, and something about bringing that energy to it, not letting your props play you if you have mm -hmm. a pen and you're doing a blah, blah, blah you know, make a gesture, but we don't need to see every little prop that you're working yeah. on where it takes away from your performance. Mm -hmm. um, I will I will break it into two categories. I'll make this quick here. Um, commercial world versus the film and episodic world. Yes, you know, very commercial, different. My yeah. joke is, oh, that, that person sells toothpaste or, you know, I, I coined the term half latte energy. You know, me like, I don't want you bouncing off the walls, but have a little energy. You're, you're going to be selling a product ultimately. It, it's a, mm -hmm. That's what you're doing in commercials. And it, we're a little more grounded in our commercials now. Like, you know, that's what our new, younger directors are liking more. You know, we're not like, you know, 1-800, da, 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 da. We're not doing that as much, but, you know, you're definitely enthusiastic and we want to see that light inside you. Film mm -hmm. and episodic, just in general, again, we can do a whole class on this, but what I'm just trying to say is, there's so much more freedom now with uh, the choices that you can make and and, and, and unless it's instructed otherwise, uh, where I just saw so many great people over the past two years since we've been doing self tapes more, just make some really creative choices where going back to the blocking, they'll, they'll start, you know, cross-legged and then they'll start a scene or they'll start at one end of the room and then go into the scene, you know, you know, don't be afraid to to break the rules a little bit when it comes to mm -hmm. episodic or TV because we're, we're now now you're creating a character now now we're yeah we want to see your interpretation of it. Mm -hmm. And I want to say that in general, uh, like it, what actors have accomplished in the in the world of self taping is actually freaking remarkable. I mean, I remember where we all were like when everything went down and everybody was like taking classes and workshops on how to make a self tape or what, you know, what the heck is one, you know? Or do I need and, this uh, wing light and am I using the right one? And, and yeah. like people are, they've, I mean, they've really elevated it to like an art. The tapes are beautiful. I mean, almost everybody's tapes are beautiful all the time. I mean, actors do a really, really, really good job of that. Um, the one thing I was going to, so kudos to you guys for keeping our industry going. Like if y'all hadn't figured out how to like We'd make be out of a job, guys. You'd have to thing, figure something like, else. We would have been up, you know, up <laughs> yeah. shit creek without a paddle. Like what are we going to do? But instead the actors came through, you know, and so we all get to keep working, you know, <laughs> so that's good. The one thing I was going to say just about a little tiny thing is like sometimes um, the prop, no prop thing, it's always uh, like, if you're if like say you sometimes you have to do something that's impossible like 
perform a surgery, you know what I mean? Or something like that. I find it best. Just make sure I don't see your hands. Like just make sure your hands are out of the frame. Don't ever let me see your hands moving in air without a prop and then pretending to do something. Just, but if you, you don't, if you keep it out of the frame and I just see your, you know, I'm planting this tree, I'm digging a grave, you know, like that uh, you'll sell it by having that part of it out of the frame. So there you go. So many different ways to do it. But yeah, I mean, you just keep making those choices that y'all are making and just, just go for it. You know, I mm -hmm. think, you, or I think, oh yeah, and create that space for yourself. Like just what a gift it is. Remember that guys, when people are like, I wish we were in the room. And yes, we do wish you were in the room sometimes, but you know, that drive an hour, you get five minutes. We only have time to see you do it once, maybe twice. You have two days to create some work and be proud of your work and then put it behind you. And, you know, I mean, just, just, just embrace that a little bit. Embrace yeah. that energy of wow, I, I, you know, I can really put my mind into this, or you know, or you're in your safe zone. You're at home, <laughs> you know. Or if you're getting yeah. taped, you get some feedback. So, yeah, all of that. Yeah, you're an artist. I mean, that's what I've seen in the tapes is that people that their sense of authority, like they're writing this, has really elevated from in the room. You know, the sense of choice making has become so strong which is great. It's less cautious for sure. They're, they're showing us their organic stuff. I love that. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you. Um, I think we kind of touched on missing, missing folks in person. Um, so I do have um, a couple more questions that I had pre-written, but um, we've had similar questions come in the chat. Um, how do you feel about receiving emails and cards and correspondence from folks? And does it matter if you've not worked with them before? I love Michael. it. Uh, Ricky, okay, yeah. I mean, yes, please. I'm old fashioned. I love receiving mail <laughs> that aren't bills. <laughs> you know? um, no, you don't have to to get it in front of our, you know, to get in the room virtually with us. You don't have to. I like it when it comes from a place of just, you know, original thought and, you know, you're just like, I had an actor to send me, uh, I mean, this goes to thank yous and stuff. I don't, we don't need them. But, you know, just a really nice card would just, she just appreciated all we've done for the past couple of years, the work she's been called in for. That really touched me. I thought that was great. And then I love hearing about y'all shows, uh, getting me out to the theater more. I can't guarantee I can always go, but I, right, Vicki, you come from the theater. I would love to yeah. see you in a show if I had the time. And, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, just keep inviting us and then just keep showing us your work. Uh, that's another great thing that the self-tape page, y'all are creating your own work. And um, I know some, you know, some pessimists might say, oh, you know, casting directors never will look at your work. I'm like, actually we do, you know, and I would yeah. love to, nothing more than just an easy link to be, oh, that's a cool little film they did. I saw it for two minutes and, you know, we remember that stuff. So that's I, great though. Yeah. And I want to, something you just said, I want to make, I want to say it in this context because it came up also in the, the SAG um, meeting that I did a month ago. Uh, in our office, we watch, uh, every tape gets watched by two people minimum. So we really, put a big effort into watching every single tape. I know sometimes actors feel like I'm just making these things and I'm just throwing them in the abyss and I don't know what the heck happens to them. But I want you to know that we we really put uh, a lot of effort into having fresh eyes watch everything, you know? So that's the way our office does. It's a minimum of, of two people watch every single tape that we get, you know? And so we thank y'all for doing them. We have tape parties. I ask my coast to coast friends sometimes, some of her are casting associates in big offices. I'm like, hey, what are you doing tonight? Okay, watch these 50 tapes with me. You know, and, and they, they love it, you know, so you might be seen by even bigger offices sometimes. Yeah, we do that. We run, we do a lot of sharing of, uh, we do written comments and then we look at each other's like, you know, afterwards, like you, we have blind, blind notes and then you can look afterwards at what everybody, what they wrote. And so it's very interesting. It's fun. That makes it fun, you know. Yeah, and a paper mailer is great. I know it costs a lot of money. Sometimes I say save the stamp, but if it's something that you really want to get to us, great. And I still like a an old hard copy headshot if it's it is that random time that I do get to see you once in a while. But don't feel the need to print it. Like, but if you're there for a director callback, sure, why not? But that's that. <laughs> awesome. Um, what advice do you have for new actors? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> uh, don't always blame your agent. No, I'm just kidding. 
they they are submitting you <laughs> denise you should know this <laughs> but um no i mean be patient it takes time this is going to be um a marathon not a sprint and um understanding your market understanding your type um but my my advice is, you know, just to get to know your market. Like, first of all, I say, do you know every casting director in Texas? Not know, know them, but do you know who they are? Maybe do some homework first and then maybe do an email introduction so at least people can know, or, hi, I'm so-and-so and I'm rented by so-and-so. So at least when we're hovering over you, you're a familiar face. Um, I know rep is very popular, but then also just make sure that you have the availability and that you are ready to do a self-tape. And, you know, your agents might want to see a sample self-tape or two so they know what quality you will bring to the table if you are called in for an audition. Mm -hmm. And training, I mean, I, I, again, I love that you're from the theater too, Vicki, because I think that's, we're kind of a dying breed. You know, I like to, I like when y'all do stage and do theater because that tells me, oh, you have the discipline to do like a six-week production, so you would do a good job on a 12-hour shoot. And, um, and then also, um, you know, I know people have different thoughts on extras work, but, you know, it's great. Um, I always say, well, is it going to take away from your day job or take away from another booking? No. And you don't have the credits. Yeah, get on a set. Get to know. Let the 80s get to know you. Let the wardrobe departments get to know you. Be liked on set. And, um, and also commercial extra work, especially if it's SAG. Oh, do it. You might get SAG eligible right away. <laughs> and that's that. So those are my, I mean, there's so many more, uh, there's so much more advice I could give. And I'm sure Vicky could give. Uh, Vicky, I want to hear your thoughts. <laughs> I, I really agree with everything that you said. And, and um, what I would say also in a nutshell, but, you know, is train, um, put yourself out there, you know, so that you can build a reel, you know, um, go to um, get on, what we lovingly call dance list. I don't know what everybody else calls it, but Yahoo, um, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, um, look for the graduate programs, look for the undergraduate um, films, um, just get yourself out there. So you're, you're meeting your people and you're, and you're making stuff um, so that you can develop, um, you know, an, enough work to get a reel together so that you can get an agent. And once you get an agent, you'll really find yourself, um, you know, getting a lot of opportunities out of that. And beyond that what i always want to say and stress is that like make your own work you know don't wait for people to pick you you know and i just think that's a healthy practice for uh you know like a, a life as an artist is like um make make your own work stay the stay you know make stay the author of your own path you know so um yeah so be sure to feed that part of yourself as well and you can use that to um uh market yourself too you know Oh, and then make sure you're up to date on your profiles, your casting networks, your actors yeah. access. I know it's up to you whether or not you want to have the subscription to be able to self-submit. That's always a touchy subject on what do I invest in? What do I not invest in? But yeah, make sure you have your profiles because then you can at least start self-submitting yourself even backstage to an extent. We don't really use backstage that much in casting. Mm -hmm. That's usually when they're casting their own projects. But mm -hmm. those are the three sites, actors access, casting networks, and backstage. I think you can find legitimate work. Um, and yeah, you know, build that resume, build that. Sometimes you'll even see commercials where they're not going through agencies and that's a little iffy. But again, if you have never been on a set or you're building your resume and you want to do a non-union lift commercial, sure, great. That's, that's one more thing you can do to, to, to keep building yourself up. And we all have a camera on our phone. There's no reason why you can't get together with an acting buddy every now and then and just shoot some work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, we had a couple of questions that kind of go together. Um, what, in your opinion, is the most important aspect of an actor nailing an audition? And then another question came in, um, what can we do to, as actors to stand out so you'll remember us? I think I touched on it. Oh, sorry, Vicky. I was, yeah. I was just going to say, just go for it. You know, I feel like when people are just overthinking or even I've had actors self-sabotage a little bit and say, oh, I'm not going to read for this. Why not? Oh, because I don't fit the breakdown. Well, we called you in because we know that this is a jumping off point. So just, and so that just stresses the point of just, just going for it. And then it, it's interesting, right? On those auditions where you're like, I nailed it. And then you didn't get it. And then the one, oh, I blew it. It was so horrible. It was so horrible. And you're mm -hmm. on hold for it. So, you know, <laughs> I, I think that you should always be proud of the work that you do, whether, you know, you feel good or bad about it. Just, just do your takes, feel confident in it, and then put it behind you. And mm -hmm. if you do get a callback, consider that a booking in your mind. 
you know, so, you know, cause I mean, it's so rare. I mean, after that it, it's out of your hands, but um, I would just say, yeah, just, just making strong choices and being proud of it. Uh, what do you think about that, Vicki? I agree with that. I was, I mean, choices is, is the first thing I wrote down. And the one thing that, I, that always, I think there's, we all look at something, we know the right way to do it. And I think that's like the worst thing you can do is do it right in a way because everybody else is doing it right you know and you watch like 50 tapes and everybody did it right um and there's just like a certain like numbingness to everybody just kind of doing it right and and the thing is it's like when everything matches um it gets kind of dull so it's like that's what the scene should be and that's what you did it's exactly that it gets kind of dull what what is interesting is when there's like you know it's like drama there's a little like there's there what well, things aren't completely um they aren't saying the same thing. The words aren't saying the same thing that the choices are saying. You know, when you add some texture or contrast or choices, um, I'm a big fan of like, I have a few actors who we used to get to see in the room and now we see them on tapes who I'm like, what the heck are they doing in there? Like what is going on in their internal life? Like they just have such strong, deep, original choices that are very private. I'll never know what they are. They always blow me away. They're so like present and just just incredibly watchable if i if i know like when we're watching and it's predictable and it goes exactly like it's supposed to it's fine um but when something is happening and it's so alive and it's so organic and that you just don't exactly know what's going to happen even though you've seen the scene 50 times already that's like a really um strong internal life and the choices to go with it you know and that brings the scene to life, in my opinion. Um, so don't don't try to do it right. Just try to do yours. Do your version of it. And think or don't think. You know, you get what I mean? Yeah. Like we, the, the camera picks up everything from like, mm -hmm. I'm hungry, I want a cheeseburger to yes. I'm worried about my next line. Mm -hmm. um, it's great when you can have like a, a nice group of readers that you can turn to, people who are reading off camera for you. Mm -hmm. uh, because then you have people who can like bounce it off don't be afraid to record the rehearsal I sometimes have people do that and they love that because and then or don't stop yourself if you were off by a word or two keep going keep going because that oh, could yeah. be the, that going back to the, the, the not being perfect you yeah. know that could be the best take and then um and then if you send us three takes we're like I kind of like that one I know they didn't get every word right but I liked what they did I mean, one, a note that we used to give in the room all the time is the least important thing is getting it word perfect, you know, and we don't get to say that to actors anymore, but it, the least important thing is getting it word perfect. Like it's not a memorization test, you know, what the most important thing is like bringing the, the scene and the relationship to, to life. And so if there's a, a word here or there that, you know, you change or it comes out wrong or, you know, whatever, just, just keep going, just keep going. Mm -hmm. It's okay Everyone to has, improvise a, a, a tad here or there to make it feel authentic to you, you know? And, and you know, those, you know, if you take, you know, your acting classes, they'll help you do what, what was the moment before, what, what is your intent, what's yep. going on in the story. Yeah. Once you start to, to, to know, know those things more important than the words will come. Why are you in the kitchen? Well, who are you talking to? Well, mm -hmm. you know, what's your next action? Well, the words will come. And if you're just more, if you're more, um, of service to the scene too. Like, you know what, have you ever been a reader for a, another actor and uh, you're just there, you're present, you're just doing good work with them and you're not even thinking about how your performance is? Well, try that energy and then just put the camera on you for the second take. Mm -hmm. That might help too, because then you're, you're less okay. self-conscious about what you're doing. You're just being of service to the scene and to the other actor in the room. And that's a lot of the roles that when we're casting day players, that's really the function. You're either in the way or you're helping, you know, <laughs> and, um, but you're, op well, you're, you're opposite, role, like, yeah. Yeah. you're opposite Claire Danes and you're either helping her or you're in her way, you know what I mean? And um, it, it's sort of like being tuned into what Michael was just saying, you know, listen, be a good listener. Mm -hmm. We need to focus yeah. more on being good listeners. Mm -hmm. And you, you can tell when an actor is a good listener, those are typically the good takes too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Use yeah, your beats. Works. Use your beats too. <laughs> there you go. We do have some more questions um, that came in the chat, but we didn't um, get to ask them yet. So we're going to let some folks um, ask them aloud for you guys so they can talk to you. Um, Tootie, can you uh, go ahead and put y'all's hands up um, or reaction shots and uh, Tootie will call on y'all. 
Yes, yeah, so we have our first question coming from Jess Packard. Jess, if you could unmute and go ahead. If you have questions, just go to re, go to the reactions button and raise your hand and we'll keep an order. We only have a few minutes left though. Hi, <laughs> I'll make this quick. Um, I just had a quick question about um, what your most memorable audition has been, whether it's good or bad, and what we as actors can take from that or learn from that. Ooh. I mean, gosh, that's a that's a question. <laughs> I, I, had a memorable, uh, I mean, there were so many great ones. I think I remember somebody falling apart, struggling, you know, in the room once. And um, and I think that was probably, uh, I, I don't mean to be on a down note, but it, I, I wanted to help her. Um, I wanted to help her succeed and, and get through it and leave. And actually her first take was great and her second take was good, but then she wanted to do it again. And it, she just started crumbling. And, and I think, I don't know if I have any, I don't know what to take away from that. I, it was a profound moment that I remember because I couldn't figure out how to help the actor like recover because it became a grudge match with the scene then. And she must've done it seven times then, you know, and uh, just never really got it back again. And I don't know, what do you say about that, Michael? Like when something like that happens? Um, well, I had something very similar about people falling apart. The hardest role I ever had to cast for an indie yeah. was a, a gay conversion therapist or someone oh who was, goodness. yeah, yeah. And that was a hot topic. It is a hot topic issue. I had agents say, oh no, they're not playing on that. <laughs> you know? And I, I, I was auditioning people who actually went through the therapy. And so there were, I had to schedule 30 minute appointments because it would inevitably be them acting, them breaking down for 10 minutes, crying in my arms. And then like, yeah. do you want to try it one more time now that they cleanse themselves? <laughs> and yeah. then, and sometimes they couldn't. And um, yeah, I mean, we, we've auditioned some deep stuff. I'm pretty sure you have too. And, and you know, mm -hmm. or I did one indie where it involved a breakup ladies. And I asked all the girls at the call back individually, like five of them, five ladies. I was like, so have you ever had a bad breakup? And they all said, <laughs> and then they would cry inevitably. And that's what we needed. But I, I would not make them do it more than twice. I was like, I, I can't mm -hmm. ask them for that. And as far as memorable, I'll just say one more thing. Most memorable slate, because my client loved it. It was for a commercial. The guy said his name, his city, but his soul lives somewhere else, is what he said. <laughs> <laughs> and he was put on hold. I'm not telling y'all to do that. <laughs> but again, he just did something not normal, and it was great. It worked out. Mm -hmm. And oh, he was playing a goth, of course, right? You know. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Yeah. Okay, so we have Jessica Pittman next. If you can unmute. Hi, so my question was, what inspired you to become like a casting director? And when did you become a casting director? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> Michael? Uh, I mean, I always, I, I love hearing, If you, I do listen to a lot of casting director bios because they just fascinate me in some way, but uh, I always feel like we kind of fall into it like where we were always kind of doing the work of it in some capacity in what we were doing. You know, I personally came from theater. I know Vicky did. I was an actor. I still do from time to time. Vicky sees my taste. Anyways, but anyway, that's another thing. But, you know, started out as a performer and then I actually became a talent agent uh, in San Antonio at a very young age. And so I loved what they were doing. I loved getting behind the actor and really pushing them and getting, developing them. And we were doing self tapes on VHS. I love those days. <laughs> I can't, I was there when Breakdown first came to Texas and all that. So, um, but then, um, you know, tenacity really helps. I remember calling like a couple casting offices and wanting to help more and the casting, it just really seemed interesting to me how an agency you're pushing your roster when casting, you can really consider anyone for the role. And that was just, I love that part of it. Whether you're repped, non-repped, you're SAG, not SAG, whether you come from the theater or you were just right. And I just felt like you were right. So um, yeah, I, you know, like I mentioned before, I started in extras and worked my way to principals. But, you know, after a while, you know, all the skills I had done up until then, and, you know, whatever I do the rest of my life has to do, they're very similar skills to what I was doing. And so basically, I just made a profession out of that. So, but what about you, Vicki? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I again, kind of fall into it. I mean, I had, I'm a, I had studied theater and I studied directing and I had, that's what I had done 
for like a whole first career was uh, basically directing and producing new plays. And then um, I segued into, I really wanted to move into film. And uh, it seemed to me like I already, and I had run a theater and I knew, like I knew every actor in Austin because we ran a festival also. And so just some, I, uh, somebody asked me if I would cast one of their features and uh, like a graduate student. And uh, I said, yes. And that was kind of how it started. It turned out to be really easy for me because I was used to working with writers from directing new plays. And, um, and that was, and it just kind of snowballed from there. But that was how I got into it, knowing actors. Okay, next we have Joel. If you could unmute, please ask your question. Hello, everyone. Uh, so my question is kind of, um, how does an actor know when they should start submitting to agencies? Like what, what type of things are you looking for um, from new talent? And like, how do I know if I'm ready to be repped? I would say if you're prepared to do an audition right now, like you feel confident in being able to do an audition, then you should, uh, what do you call that, submit to agencies. Because they um, they make their money when you get a booking. So, um, and in order to get a booking, you have to audition successfully. And yeah, that's kind of the catch-22 with acting. If you, I don't know if you agree with that, Vicky. Like you can be a great actor, but not such a good auditioner and vice versa. I know some people who are just really good at auditioning and they're okay, you know, they're not that bad. You know? <laughs> I'm not trying to criticize, but um, I think, you know, just, you know, just basic foundations or scene study classes, improv, just being really comfortable in your skin, being able to make those choices, as we said, um, watching a couple YouTube videos or even taking a self-tape class, that might help. But if you feel all set up, you have your phone, you have a, a ring light, you're good to go. Um, I think that's great. And then each each agency is going to be a little bit different. Some might want you to get more experience. Some are going to say, do a couple indies and then and then call me. Some might be like, oh, well, I want you out of the starting gate. Because then also um, you have to ask yourself, you know, uh, well, you don't have to ask yourself, but the, agent, the agents um, are going to be seeing how you factor into their current existing roster to see if they need your time. So um, there's a million and one reasons why they would or would not sign you. But I think personally, if you feel comfortable and confident in the audition process and as an actor, then you're ready to get an agent, I think. What about you, Vicki? I'm going to agree with that. I th actually think that's a, a perfect uh, personal criteria. You know, if you feel like you're ready to go in the room or make your own self tapes these days, then um, I think that that's probably a good, that's a good way to, to judge, you know, if you're ready. And if you have a little bit of work to show to somebody, I think that it, that's helpful. Always helps. Always helps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yannis, are you ready for your question? Uh, yeah, Yannis, actually. Hi, Vicki. Haven't seen you in a while. And hi, Michael. Yes. Thanks. Hi, Yannis. Good to see you. <laughs> you know, I don't have a question. I just wanted to respond to what both of you guys talked about, and that was in your self-tape, how you see 50 people coming in and they're doing it right, but then into, what really jumps out to you is something is to take a risk and do something a little bit different. And I, I'm going to speak for myself, but I can say this for most actors, is that we, we, we get the scene, we read it, we know how it's supposed to go. Well, there's a little bit of fear in me to want to try to do something a little bit different, thinking, well, Vicky's going to get this audition and she's going, Giannis does, didn't even read the script. He doesn't know what's going on. So that fear kind of goes in, if you know what I'm talking about. I guess, do. guess what I'm doing is I'm asking for your permission. <laughs> uh -huh. You know, um, no, not, not, I mean, generally, if it's a really long scene, we're not submitting two takes. If it's a shorter scene, sometimes we are. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do appreciate the fact that you guys did say that about you know, getting in there and trying to do something a little bit different that catches your attention. Um, yeah, I feel like that. that's why we always ask, to be honest, it's a great, I mean, I, it's, I, it is a catch 22, you know, yeah. and I understand because we, we don't get to have a process with each other where we go like, well, this one's just for fun, you know, or like, you know, what else do you have in your pocket? You know, which one, what, what take were you thinking of that you didn't we do? We don't today? have Let's that time, that one, you know, yeah. which we used to do in the room all the time. So what, what did you prepare that, you know, what's the other one you prepared, you know? And then when this context, I, we always ask for two takes specifically for two reasons. One, so the actor can show they have range because um, th there's no way for um, the creative team to know <laughs> since they never have callbacks anymore for anything, you know. And um, the other is so that you can, um, uh, one, you can kind of do the one they're asking for and the other one you can do the one that sparked your imagination, you know. But I know a lot of casting directors don't ask for two takes. And so the pickle then is, you know, 
can you split the difference a little bit? I don't know. You know? I think that's it because I was in the catching Ninja workshop this past weekend and he he direct he everybody did the first scene like I did and then he came back and gave a redirection and it was completely different from what how I would have originally read it and mm -hmm. it was so uncomfortable for me doing the scene mm -hmm. but he thought it was really interesting you mm -hmm. know so I'm like well yeah I'd love to make it interesting for you but then I don't want to run that risk of he almost doesn't know what's going on in the scene no yeah don't be different for the sake of being different like don't take the, this with a grain of salt where you or take this with a grain of salt where you're like well these two casting directors said i have to be different in every audition well no, no we don't say that we're just saying add your take if that if it's something different from the first take i think the problem we ran into in the room a lot and if these poor people not poor people people who put you on tape oh let me just do it different and it's the same take over and over and over it's like no I, i've already seen that take we're good and then there's nothing wrong with just standing behind your one good take that you feel good about if that and that shows a lot of confidence too you know, but the, the, there's pros and cons. The pro is we already have that other take. So if the director's asking or the client's asking for more footage, we already have it. We don't even have to bother you. And then, you know, but then, in the, or we get to choose if you give us four takes or something like that. And then also it varies on your rep too. Like in LA, you have an agent, you have a manager, you might even have a lawyer. You might, you could have so many people, you have your local Texas rep. And so they're all giving their two cents on what their process is. They might want to look at the footage before they send it off to the casting director. So right. th there's a lot of var variables with that. But yeah, I mean, as long as y'all feel comfortable with your takes, that's all we ask. But I want to say one more thing about that, which is back to what Giannis was saying. And there's a how to how to split the difference. Or I mean, splitting the difference is really not the answer. I mean, I had a wonderful friend who was a good, very good director and such. And, and we would look at, talk about these things together. And he would say, it's like watching everybody slide down the same slide into the same pool, slide down the same slide into the same pool, slide down the same slide into the same pool. Mm -hmm. And um, all you want to do is not do that. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you don't have to, you don't have to jump out of a, uh, out of, a, you don't have to, you know, jump out of an airplane, you know, and parachute in, but you, you just have to not do that exact same thing that everybody's doing you just know? find one small little something different that yeah. that would maybe even make me feel just slightly out of my comfort zone but mm -hmm. nothing so obnoxious that it's like okay what is this guy doing okay i usually think it's just in the internal life you know i usually mm -hmm. think it's just a, an internal choice that um it, it's not some radical exterior manifestation okay. it's just uh an internal choice that's different than everybody else's all right. You know, it's very, it can be very small. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So what we're saying is don't split the difference. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly. Right. Exactly. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys both very much. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Good Hi, to see Taylor. You. Are you ready? Are you looking for me? Yes. Your hand is raised. Do you have a question? Yes. 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 So the question is uh, do you guys get feedback uh, from the director or studio on your pinned actors? And if so, what are a few examples of that feedback from the ones who weren't chosen versus the ones who booked it? Ooh. I feel like if it's a select group or you're there down to the wire, we're going to hear it, whether it's verbally, usually not in an email. That's just what I like. I'm on the phone with the director and we're going over the five selects or you know, who usually you hear more about who they want to see. And then you can decipher from there. Oh, they, you know, and no notes can necessarily not be a bad thing. They liked your work, you just weren't right for that for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and then there are times where I, you know, some of the reps, you know, if we do have that time, they're like, can we please get some feedback? Or you really feel for that actor because you you felt that they were like your top choice in casting and, you know, you put it out to them and you're like, mm, I'm, I'm curious, you know. Vicky taught me a long time ago when we were pitching actors. I think you did, someone, I think you did. Like when we're really pushing an actor not to just, overly pitch them it was this more yeah. about this person because they have to think it's their idea if um, i go i love them like i, I feel exactly. like a person we have to kind of trick them in a way to be like what about that person okay uh, you yeah on it, you know? like, we always put our favorite third on the tape on the tape yeah exactly <laughs> like yeah. like we try to smuggle them in you know like just you know this yeah. person's great you know do you, no. do you actively look for feedback then vicky i mean i feel like if it comes organically that's when i get it or if i really have to nudge them then that's when i get it yeah i don't think that if i get it if i if it comes i agree and i wish we could we i wish there was a more of a uh 
a back and forth process, but mostly it's just everything's moving so quickly. You get the the feedback about uh, why what was working and therefore that person, you know, and mm -hmm. not why they made that choice over another person very rarely, you know, right. Unfortunately. No time, not enough time in the day. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thanks. Sure. Okay. We do have a few more questions. So um, if you guys have time to stick around for just a little longer. Sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Pam. Thank you. Um, and thank you for your time. Thanks everyone. Um, so uh, exactly on the lines of what we're talking about, say I did submit a tape uh, with like two different tapes, very opposing choices. And then I get a callback chemistry read and or direct booking. How do I know which was the one to go with? You can always, well, um, when you're on, when you're on the Kim read, you can, when you're on the zoom or if you're in the room, you can just ask them, you can say, I sent two takes. One was, you know, sort of like this and one was sort of like that, you know, which one did you prefer? You just ask them. That's the preference. Okay. Yeah. And you, you can probably ask casting ahead of time if they happen to know, you know, Thank and you. if we do our due diligence, we will ask for like more specific feedback because by then the directors already sent us notes in general. Now that they're narrowing down their selection, you know, like what we'll, we'll, we might have storyboards by then, or we might have more to go off yeah. of so we can point you in the right direction. Yes, a little energy. more information. And then, exactly. it, and then we're also going to vet how they want to run the callback to, you know, sometimes they just want us to run everything. Sometimes we're just kind of sitting in the background and they take the lead. So mm -hmm. then. I think just being as malleable as possible really helps. <laughs> Go with. Got it. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, next we have Anil. 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 Okay. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey guys. Uh thank hey. you so much for everything. Um question is uh I know that a lot of actors have started making their own uh clips in lieu of reels like obviously when they're starting out they don't have a lot of footage. Mm -hmm. Uh in regards to those should they be character type neutral or should they be leaning towards kind of a certain type that either we think that we can play or that people tell us we could play or how do you how do you like gauging that what are your thoughts mickey because i have mine oh, i was gonna say <laughs> if you're gonna if you're gonna if you're making your own content for the for promoting yourself um i uh i mean i would say uh i i, may, I guess i would say do the interesting one you know what i mean like it yeah, like if you have a, if you have a um, if you have a strategy on something and it seems fun to play, I would do I would do that. Um, I'm not, I'm not understand the question exactly. What do you uh, like? What categories like comedy or drama or even sci-fi western? And all yeah, that? I'll take, you know, I would put yourself in the mind of: Is this a theatrical project? Is this a commercial? Maybe just keep it that simple you know, that way. And then if you do have a lot of comedy versus drama, then maybe you could do two different categories. Here's my drama reel. Here's my yeah. comedy mm -hmm. one. It all depends on how much footage you have and what you're going out for, having those clips ready. Um, and I'm even I'm even okay with audition self-tapes that you're proud of um, to, 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 as a place setter, because um, I know that was kind of looked down upon pre-COVID, but post-COVID, I like to be able to see, oh, if I click that, then that tells me you're going to be able to deliver a pretty good self tape or at least bring some good choices too. So mm -hmm. I don't mind that as a placeholder until you get the actual footage or if it's footage that you've self produced. Cool. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Amaya? Hi. So Hi. As, far, as far as actors' access, do casting directors watch self submissions? Because I heard they could be further down because like there's a ranking system of how they show up. And should you be self-submitting if you have an agent? Okay, two separate questions. Should you be self-submitting? Let's answer that one. Should you be self-submitting if you have an agent? I would talk to your agent about that. Um, sometimes we do cast indies where there's not an agency fee associated. And so it doesn't behoove them to self-submit. I like it when an actor just goes for their work. If you're a reputable casting director like we are, we've been doing this, we have great relationships with all the agents. If you're up for the job or you booked the job, I say, okay, who's your agent so I can loop them in. So then they can kind of like at least bill for it or, or help negotiate or look at the talent release. So I think it shows that you good initiative uh, for the agent too, because it's also sometimes if there is an agency fee or it's an inclusive fee, you know, where uh, the agent's happy that you're procuring your own work. 
Uh, but then, and it just depends on the agent too. Sometimes they might not want the usage for a certain commercial. And I just, I, I'm totally open to that. If the agent's like, oh, I know they self-submitted, sorry, they can't play on this one. I'm like, okay, well, thanks for letting me know. Um, and then as far as, what was the first question? Oh, uh, Vicky, what's your two cents on them self-submitting? Well, I was gonna say, I'm not that familiar with the self-submission on Actors Access, so. So you can open it up to, you know, just the agents or they can self-submit through Actors Access. So okay. you, can, you can click the button. I do think you do, oh, maybe, uh, it just depends on the project. Uh, and do we look at all of them? I do. I mean, if there's even five pages of submissions, uh, yeah. We, yeah, we go through yeah. all of them. Now, I, I'm glad you mentioned the algorithm, though. Remember, I was just saying how the, the self tapes could be a good placeholder. Um, if you have a reel on Actors Access, you, you, the, you are seen in the first batch of people, and then the further down are the people without the reel. And then further down are the people who didn't even bother to put their resume. I might not click on you if you don't have a resume filled out because I want to know have you acted. So at least fill out the basic profile. I do know it costs money to add additional headshots and to add a reel or add a slate. That's an investment on your own. Uh, but um, I think honestly, the more content you have in there, the more chances you are going to be seen for higher level projects. Thank you. Next, we have Edmundo. Hello. Hello. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've worked uh, with you guys before, so it's so cool to be able to uh, be here and ask you some questions, get a little deeper, so we can assist each other in the future as well. Um, the uh, question that I that I kind of ask myself a lot is, um, I, I travel a lot and I see some really awesome uh, castings. And I'm like, man, if I want to submit for this, it's just going to be like a dirty background. The lighting's going to be messed up and so forth and so forth. Like I've like run like to the store to buy like a little ring light because it was like super last notice. Um, but it, I, my, my question is, do you um, at that point, if there's just like no way to make it work, should we bother to submit? Also, I know you guys are really crunched for time. I'm sorry for asking two questions, but um, uh, after being in the room, get really excited about you know all, all the work that we did um is would it be appropriate at any time to ask for uh feedback on the audition or just uh keep, keep on rolling and then go for the next one uh yeah uh, uh, answering that last question first yeah please be mindful of the time if you are in the room um just be because first of all we haven't even processed your audition yet we're just trying to get through the day <laughs> and then we'll have a chance to let it marinate um i don't know i mean if you feel like it went really bad or you know or you're just like hey was that fine i'll be like yeah that's fine or i'll be like mm, I'm, i i don't know i mean i haven't been in the room as often recently um I, I, asking for feedback if it's a self-tape i don't think is wrong but at the same time understand it will take some time uh, uh mickey what is your take on that second part of that question um, oh yeah, I think if it, it, in the days where you know you were seeing you know a lot of people in the room, it's it, it's definitely we're under a very stressful situation. So it's probably not the time to get feedback at that point. But the but if you could have your your yeah. rep or whatever conduit we're using to communicate, like reach out for some particular feedback, that would work. And in terms of if um, you should go for the audition if you don't have all the tools, yeah. You just do the best you can, you know what I mean? Like find some natural light, um, find a, a, take the art off the wall, you know, do something to, to, to make it neutral. You can control your situation, you know. Um, I, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll use myself as an example. I taped for something a while back. Um, um, I go for things once in a while, <laughs> exercise that. But um, I I wasn't in the mood. I was like, I don't want to do this. I don't. I'll, I'll explain the, in my biography why I didn't want to do it. But anyways, but <laughs> that was the one I got pinned for, and I thought mm -hmm. it was like the throwaway audition I did. So it's a, it goes back to that whole taping the rehearsal, or if you messed up a line, I would just that could be the one you get put on hold for, um, and then uh, just make sure. I, I think the one tape I deleted not too long ago a woman was taping in a stall in a restroom whispering and i could hear the echoes and i was like maybe this wasn't the best place to do a self tape. <laughs> yeah. i'm not going to show that to my client <laughs> also i think if you're in a hotel room it actually works to your favor a little bit because it uh it i always go oh they're working 
Mm-hmm. You're like, oh, they're on set working. They had to shoot. I in do their like the on set ones when they're you know? in the crafty area and they're like, okay, I had a PAT for me. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there's, yeah. there's a lot of um, forgiveness. I've yeah. had people do virtual callbacks from set, right? Have you ever had that? All the time now. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's kind of stunning. You know, they'll work it out with like whoever's running the set or whatever. I just need 30 minutes right now. And right. they'll be on set and they'll do their callback on set. I mean, or even not 10, saying like, it's I'll the be, best I'll, way to do it, out. but yeah. it's kind of cool <laughs> that they can be working and have a callback on the same day. Yeah. That's kind of cool. You know, that's a, that's a point of conversation we can have with the client too, or the director. Wow, they're on set. They're doing. They're, on, they're working. It's always it's always appealing when someone's <laughs> that's working. That's you can. You know? you know? <laughs> yeah. Marie Bennett, are you ready? Yes. Okay. Um, hi everyone. Um, I'm like new to this whole acting room, so I've just been absorbing in all of the information, and I'm super grateful to be here. Um, But I also, so I've been modeling for a few years, so I have familiarity with being on set. And one thing that I've gotten into is styling. And I wanted to ask you guys, um, is that something that you guys cast for as well? Or is that within a separate department when it comes to like wardrobe and stuff like that? Because I would love to get on set for like commercials and films and stuff those would be the department heads the head of wardrobe head or the line producer or the uh, upm uh those are the ones who hire for those positions so you 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 can even go on the texas film commission austin film commission a lot of those sag sometimes has listings uh where you'll find people who have those specific um crew jobs and then send an email and say, hey, this is my stuff. This is where I live. Here's my resume. Here's samples of my work. Um, I do feel like when we're busy, like when all gears are grinding, we have uh, films going on and commercials, they're going to want day help at least. And then that's how you work your way into local departments. And then they'll start to hire you, hopefully, you know, full time. Uh, what do you think about that, Vicki? Agreed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Alex. Hi guys, um, I just had a quick question. Do you guys ever decide to not pass an actor's tape on to production if after watching it, you decide that that actor kind of missed the mark or didn't understand direction and maybe there isn't time for a redirection? Yes. Here's the thing, yeah, I feel like we're just as strong as our choices too. So, um, Okay, something I hate is when a client wants choices for the, or a big number for the sake of that, and I fight back against that or push back against that. Like, I know, Vicki, you told me a long time ago, too, like, if you have, like, seven or eight strong choices per role, that's great, especially mm-hmm. commercially. But, you know, I know every number is different. But, like, if a client's like, oh, give me 50 options, I'm like, no, you don't need 50 because we've already vetted those options mm-hmm. for you. Uh, but yeah, if I have already 10 to 12, I'm just throwing numbers out there. If I'm looking at the link and I'm like, oh, we have stronger, I'm not going to lead in with my weaker choices. So uh, that doesn't mean that we, I won't keep your tape on file. And then another good thing about that, I'll just lay out all the cards. What if they want another session? Well, guess what? I can just show the director your tape now because I feel like, okay, here's another pass. And then so that audition wasn't wasted too. And I didn't have to ask you to retape or come back into a room per se. And then there's times where we don't have time to cast. And then we have to be like, oh, well, look at these previous videos we've cast off. <laughs> and, uh, and sometimes people get a quick roll from that. So, but yeah, we do, we, we do have to pass on tapes once in a while. For me, the, um, for commercials, we always pass on every tape, unless you're, you're, you don't meet the criteria as in you're in New York or you're, you know, it's like a distance criteria mm-hmm. not fly you in. Um, or it's like some extremely strange wipeout like your sound isn't working or there's some but our in general our rule for commercials is we pass on every tape because you never really know what they're going to want for a commercial you know um know. commercials they are very know. quirky <laughs> tapes and they will they will put they will pick the person in your you know they'll they'll go all over it's inevitably you know, the person you thought was the least likely is the person they'll cast and stuff like that. So 
we send every single commercial tape to them. Narratives are very, very different though. You can't send a director 50 people. They'll get overwhelmed, know? right? They'll be like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if it's a lead or it's a large supporting role or something like that, there are more of them. But when you get to um, the, um, like the day players in particular, you you have to call it to um, 10 at the, maybe 12 at the most. Mm -hmm. So seven to 12 really is what happens. And so we have to uh, kind of call and send for those. And we try to send um, a package. We don't send all the same thing. We send a, a range and we send some things that they're not asking for you know we send curveballs in that and um we send some things that we know they're not looking for in that so we start try to um not duplicate too much you know but that's how we how we have to do the the smaller roles um and i yeah unfortunately we can't send every tape because we i mean i've tried <laughs> you know <laughs> and they're like what <laughs> don't send me right. 50 of this you know so they really only want uh love and death like leslie wanted seven she did not want more than seven um i sent her 15 for like big roles and she was like i really only want seven <laughs> i'm like really just seven that's yeah. so hard you know so yeah. it's very very hard yeah. There was a commercial. I cast one role. I gave mm -hmm. 30 tapes. It's an old style client, old fashioned, old fashioned. Yeah. Model. And he was like, is that it? Is that it? I'm like, what do you mean? He got 30. And it was Thanksgiving week. I wasn't in the mood. I had already made my money that much. And I was like, you know what? I don't got time for another one. I passed it off to another casting director with those 30 options. And I think they asked for like 200 more or something like that. It was a ridiculous number to cast one role. So I was happy I didn't have to make that call because I even had to put the little, I, I'm not going to ask 200 people to tape for one. I'm just not, you know, because then again, and, and I had to even break it down. Like, okay, for every one tape, we probably vetted at least 10 or 12 options and that, 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 because that's another, we're trying to be mindful of your time too. We want to call you in if we think you can book it. So we're not just going to blindly ask you for a tape without knowing mm -hmm. what you can do. I mean, yeah. And is it like that for guest star and like reoccurring roles on TV shows as well? Those are, that's a good question for guests. Like I was saying, Leslie, who was the director for Love and Death, she just wanted seven. <laughs> I was just like, please let me give you more than seven. There's, I've got 15 to 20 that you should see, you know? And, um, um, but I would say for narratives, you've got more space and certain directors, they just like to, so like, for instance, we do a lot for Rick. He loves to see he does. A, a much, a much wider number of <laughs> options. It's very easy to give him 20 people for a role and, you know, he won't bat an eye. He'll watch them all. Um, so narratives are, there's more space in that TV is the hardest because the timelines are so tight for the directors that they that's why they just want so few they might be watching tapes on their cell phone in the middle of a location scout like mm -hmm. that like how mm -hmm. quick they're making those decisions on tv so that's why they have to make it so brief mm -hmm. okay so we have time for four more short questions and next we have dm dm der um yes i'm i'm really excellent for my um, son he's a he's a high schooler and um he's done theater arts in, in high school and um, I'm just trying to find out what's the best way to get him prepared. You mentioned, Vicki, you know, make your own work. You know, mm -hmm. can you give it like examples of make your own work? And um, if he, do you recommend him getting an agent or just like making films and just trying to put it out there so he can get exposure? Yeah, a lot of people, I mean, I, I you know, it's very, yeah, just, yeah, he should make some, uh, you know, sketch comedy or, write scenes with his friends and shoot them, you know, and put them up on a YouTube channel. A lot of, uh, a lot of people do that and make, you know, great livings doing it, honestly. But I also know a lot of um, actors um, kind of started doing things like that. And um, it's a, it's a great way to just get started. Um, other ways to get started are find an acting class for him. It's really fun because he'll find a community in the acting class and they'll, um, and probably people in the acting class will also be wanting to short a shoot, shoot a short film. So they'll cast from their acting class and just starting to participate as a way 
um, for him to kind of get his footing. So do you recommend an agent or do y'all look at um, YouTube videos too, like you and uh, Mr. Michael? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you send it to us directly, yeah. Us and our yeah. team will watch it. Uh, but yeah, and as far as agencies, you know, you kind of have to do your own scouting for that. Um, um, I always look at, see how long an agency has been in business because they don't have to be licensed and bonded by the state anymore. So John Doe can open up an agency, but then you'll know by the roster, like, are these reputable actors, these people with this resume with this actor, then, you know, so start to do, and almost every agency has a website. So, you know, you can start to look. And then a, a little piece of advice I give, you know, I feel like if you're a good Texas agent, you're pretty much going to submit them across the whole state because that's how they make a living. Yeah. So you're not just bound to Austin agents. You could find a good one in Dallas or find a good one in Houston. I find a good one. Lydia Blanco is in Corpus and she's great. I'm just using that as an example, but just to be like, or there's some good San Antonio ones. So, um, and that's, a, that's a, a discussion to have with when you are taking meetings with your agency, like what territories do they, are they all over Texas? Or are they not? Uh, but yeah, do your homework and go for, and what's cool about getting into class too, I'm sure some of those kids will have agents too. So they might even give you referrals too. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. That's true. Good luck. Joseph. Is that me? That's yes. you, Joseph. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I didn't know it was Joseph. I thought it was Joey. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, Hi, hello. Uh, I just want to say thank you all so much for this. Um, it's been very great, very uh, educational. Uh, I have so many questions, but I'm just going to ask one and it's a very selfish one. Um, <laughs> I, I get pulled for a lot of uh, dancing auditions. I think it's mostly because my one commercial on my actors access is a dancing commercial. And Vicki, um, you have pulled me for some dancing commercials. One of the things that I stress out about is um, the space. And I know we've talked about this. And when I booked my commercial, I wasn't represented and I didn't know what I was doing. So I didn't have a blank wall. I didn't have um, a backdrop or anything now. But now that I do, it's it's I know it might be a little bit different. But for dancing wise, do we do I need to move my entire living room out of the way? Or is it OK if like the couch is there? or the tables there, you know, like just to give me more room. Cause I find that I, I feel like I am a good dancer and I find that I'm limiting to my space to just be in front of the blue screen, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I think if you, if the audition specifically uh, is about something as phys uh, like physicality, like dancing, then the rules change a little bit, you know, and you just, mm -hmm. you have to, you know, yeah, use the space that you have and it's fine to see your couch and, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's more about the, in that situation, it's it's more about the, you know, the athletics, you know, the soccer or the dancing, the skateboarding than, um, I mean, you wouldn't skateboard in your living room, you know, you have to go outside. To right. Shoot. Yeah. Right. So same for like dancing, just go wherever you can, you know, cut a rug and do it, you know. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Good question there. Thank you. Sure. It's been really great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good to see you. Laura, are you ready? Unmuted. Um, I was wondering in regard to uh, readers on self tapes, are there any services that you recommend if someone needed to hire a reader or if you had any advice of what you see people doing wrong or right with working with a reader for self tapes? Find one in your community. I mean, even just like a few local actors. I mean, I don't think you should have to pay for a reader. There are services out there, I think LA based and New York based where they'll like hire us, we'll be your reader. Uh, I'm sure you could find people in this group who would read for you if you read for them. That's usually the give and take. Um, and then like if you, whether you use Instagram a lot or TikTok or Facebook uh, or even just have a text chain with local actors or if you happen to be involved in a class, um, you know, whenever I need a reader for audition, say, I don't want to have to worry about being the reader. I'll ask, Hey, who wants to be a reader today? And, uh, people do sign up for that. Devin, I know you've been a reader before for Vicky a lot. And, and so mm -hmm. that's great. I Vicky saw Pam wave and I'm going to add you on Instagram. <laughs> Make friends with this group. You're going to find readers in here. That, that's I was going to say, you know, when, uh, I mean, like having a, a really good reader is just a, is something that will really Im improve your audition, you know? Um, so, uh, I know that's not always, it's not always possible. And when things were really bad and very shut down during COVID, it was delightful when people would read with their 
their fourth grader, you know, it's, I mean, you know, it was, I mean, it was really very sweet. And actually I really loved those tapes very, very much. Um, but for performance wise, you know, get, get one of your actor friends who will be very generous and very present with you and give you something to push against and give them some notes, tell them to do it differently to get different reactions out of you, you know? And then you can the think about a reader is they can do the work for you. You can tell them to do something and it'll, or tell them to surprise you. You know, you can give them direction that will make your audition better. And if you don't have a reader, you could record the lines and paste it to where, you know, you know it, it, it fills in. Or if you have GarageBand or one of those editing mm -hmm. things, you could just fill in the lines yourself. Uh, but yeah, like Vicky said, there's nothing like a, a good present actor to help you with your performance. But again, and then if you do have to bring a mom or a friend or a brother or an uncle or a boyfriend or girlfriend, uh, just uh, a little bit of advice if they're right next to your camera, have them use like I call it the, the, the bathroom voice where it's just a little lower than usual or like a, you know, so they're not shouting right next to where you're recording or they're not overacting and distracting from the tape. Uh, they're just I mean, they're just being present with you. And that's I mean, one thing that we we critique a lot on is dead eyes, you know, and uh, and it's unfortunately dead eyes is something that comes from not having a reader, and you can't really help it. It's really hard, <laughs> you know. But uh, but if you have to record by yourself and you don't have a reader, um, you know, I, I think even just having a, a a picture of someone that you're looking at is going to improve the energy in your eyes, or having somebody um, like zoom in on a on a phone, you know, and, and where you're interacting with, um, uh, when you're looking at a person is always better than looking in the air, you know, um, 100% always better. If you can do that on any level, even if they're on a, a screen, it will help your performance. And we were talking about making choices pretty much the whole time here. Choose your eye lines for sure. Like, you know, like even if you have to tape like a post-it or something to either side, so it's consistent on where, or your mind's not having to worry about where is this imaginary person, mm -hmm. you know, like that just helps with, with your choices right there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And our last two questions are coming from Devin and Angelique. Devin. Hi, Devin. Oh, hi. How are Good you? Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you too. I actually, that was what my question was going to be about anyway. So, cause I always kind of record my own lines and then do the audition with myself. And I've started to wonder if that's holding me back or if that's terribly noticeable. And if that's something that you guys pick up on and wish I wasn't doing. Well, you know, I mean, I will, I will say um, there's, you know, we're, we've entered a whole new world. Yeah. Because, I mean, you know, I mean, yeah. Devin, we work together a lot and Devin read for a lot of shows and, you know, and you could see when you were the reader, what a great, what a difference it could make for the actor to have a reader and changing what the reader did and all that kind of, and there were strategies we did in the room all the time. I mean, the worst thing is the mechanical voice, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> like that's the, the, the worst off-camera reader is the, the digitized mechanical voice. And we hear that sometimes, so <laughs> oh, like, really never, like never do that one. <laughs> And reading with yourself, I find it distracting when I when I I hear it's the actor's voice, and because I know that they're not playing off of anything, yeah. you know that they're all they're they're just self generating like in a vacuum, and um, it, I, I think it can limit the performance. I think if you if there's any way to get a person, Devin, I would I would say. To try yeah, to that do seems that. like the biggest challenge of this era is just because the auditions are usually so quick now it's like just getting somebody there but uh good to know thanks for yeah. no no it's good and, and let me think on it some more and, and let's follow up on it too because it's it's uh it's part of the thing that we started with like the crossboarding i have got seven auditions today i've got you know like what kind of a, you know like who has a friend that's going to do seven auditions with them you know what i mean like it's it's a lot to to ask of that so again it's like it's pushing it all onto the actor not only do you have to direct your own thing you, you know da, 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 but you have to you know like staff your audition you know yeah. like and, the quicker you get it in the better kind of too so it's like uh -huh. if i can pour this real quick and get it in i try to but i, I mean if you could find a, an actor friend who could um record the line so it's a different voice i knew i know some people that they they're geniuses at tricking you into thinking it's a real person you know like they'll run speakers and have this you know like they'll, they'll do a really great job um katie dallas she's a genius at that um and uh but i think having a, a 
a different voice because so much of the audition is about convincing. I mean, you know, you're just trying to convince someone that it's real mm -hmm. and anything that works against the, the convincing is going to slip back, you know? So if, if it was a different voice, um, even if it were pre-recorded, I think that would be a, a cut above, you know? Mm -hmm. And even, even on Zoom, that's great because then at least you can say, oh, let's yeah. do it again. Okay, do you have a minute? Okay, great. Let's do it three. Yeah, just minutes. call up a friend and have do let's a Zoom with them. And, it up a bit. Yeah. And then, and then, then you could go, you know, work the piece, you know, all you want to with that. Yeah. Kind of exactly. And I always like to brag. I'm always like, there's three directors already I've worked with. They're like, can we get a Devin type? Like, he's a type. <laughs> and I'm always like, oh, he's not available. <laughs> No, I always check with him first, but I was like, thanks, Devin, for setting the bar high. They want your type. <laughs> That's good to hear. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. It's true. Angelique, you, ha you have a final question. Yeah, I just had a quick question um, for both Michael and Vicky. When do you think, like, the busy season will be? Um, is there, like, specific, like, months or just wondering um, when you get, like, a lot of, like, requests for auditions and um, extras and acting? I think it's usually the fall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, August, I never, I never make plans in September. Yeah, because I feel like then summer ends and then, yeah, September, October through the, and, until right before the holidays, right? Mm -hmm. And then we're like, okay, you know. That's what we did, like, six commercials in the first week of 2023. I have no idea why. I mean, it was insane. So it's uh, every you know everything's everything's new, but traditionally, I would say August through September uh, through um, November. Yes. Okay, so I think this concludes our mixer. I appreciate everyone coming out, and uh, we're going to have Gary close us out. Thank, Thank you so guys. much, Tootie. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Denise, for being the interviewer. All of you folks, we had a hundred and some odd people tonight. So uh, obviously, you folks are rock stars, Vicky and Michael. Uh, oh, <laughs> goodness, you may have not known it, but to our sweet ladies, Tootie, Denise, and Judith, thank you all. We're going to take off next month. I've done this for about fifteen years. I don't think other than March, I've missed a, a month in fifteen years. Uh, and we're going to regroup, but uh, get some new younger blood in, some new core members. And this was very inspirational, seeing such intelligent, passionate, did I say passionate casting directors? Thank you all. <laughs> you really inspired people. You really did. Thanks. And uh, we hope to see you all soon. We'll, uh, I'll send out an email, let you know about our next mixer. We will be taking time off. But Denise, thank you. Tootie. Thank you, Judith. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. And especially thank those of y'all who tuned in. These folks dedicated a lot of time to us. I praise to you. Thank you. Thank you so much thank for having us. It was really great to be with everybody and I just love seeing all your faces and, and getting to talk with y'all. If you a question or ask a question, just email us. We'll answer yep. it for you. <laughs> Good night, folks. Thank y'all.